think just one of the important things to say in wrapping up is that this has been a kind of a combined industry <coughs> perspectives and academic conference and um, you know it's it's very important that the um, theoretical papers and the research-based papers and the new data and evidence and so on does see the light of day beyond a conference which is sort of very ephemeral and you know everybody's very excited on the day. Um, so the, the African Journal of Information and Communication, for which I'm the corresponding editor, has just published issue 23 this week um, and we are looking forward that uh, some of the key papers from this Threat 2019 conference uh, will be considered for peer review for publication or for possible publication um, in Agit 24 and Agit 25. So we produce um, two issues a year. The next issue will be published in December 2019 and the one after that, uh, issue 24 in, um, in June 2020. Um, what that means is, and I think Manoj uh, did, at, the conference organizers did advise authors that if you wish your paper to be <coughs> published or to be considered for publication in the journal, then uh, ideally you should publish what you've produced for the conference as an extended abstract, not as a full paper. Okay? Because if it's published as a full paper in the conference proceedings, we cannot then consider it for publication in the journal. So that's just a little choice you have to make and, you know, we'll communicate with you uh, outside of the conference. And then the second little very short item, even shorter item, is that um, we do offer through the Link Center at Wits University a, a, a short course uh, called um, Advanced Professional Practice in Cybersecurity Leadership. Um, what's important about it is not so much the two weeks that people... Um, you know, sit in class face to face, uh, that's, that's obviously necessary for certification purposes and so on, and, and, and it is a quite powerful content. But what's really important is the sort of case study stroke research paper uh, that participants write. So usually, uh, one only does, you know, a research paper as part of a degree program. <laughs> But what we do is that with a couple of our short courses, we invite people to do research papers which are actually equivalent to the honors level. And what that enables is a, a, a transition to uh, a possible master's through recognition of prior learning. Because you can then upload your research paper, particularly if you've got 65% or higher, um, as supporting documentation for recognition of prior learning. And this is really important because in South Africa we have a, a, a industry that has evolved very much through professionalism, you know, through uh, developing expertise uh, rather than qualifications. And uh, uh, while expertise and professionalism is very important, uh, qualifications are also important because uh, they, they generate other opportunities to fill the kind of gaps that, that you've been talking about. So that's just very quickly, but I think we can we can share that with informa uh, information with people via email, right, Manoj? Okay. So thank you for that, and um, really now over to the the audience. Uh, you know, final couple of questions. Maybe let's take about five questions. Uh, take a group of five questions, and then we can ask um, the panel members to respond to those questions. Who would like to go first? Yes, please. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tapur. I'm, I'm a security officer at Standard Bank. So I've got questions here. I've been listening, especially sometimes I listen to politics a lot. U.S.-China issue. Is it China a threat or U.S. a threat? <laughs> because if you look at the Snowden issue, Cisco gear is planted with backdoors. And if not 90% is Cisco within the internet. So Huawei is here in Africa as well. So is US not a threat as well to internet security or to economy <laughs> security as well? Uh, okay. So uh, are there any, is there anyone with a kind of a similar question? Then maybe we can handle those two questions. I might just, I can switch it from time. Uh, anyone with a similar question? No. So I think let's, let's deal with that question. Update in the back. Uh, yes. Just hang on one second.
it, it is a bit uh, similar. My name, my name is Yamkela, sorry. Uh, and uh, I'll just uh, throw it at anyone who's going to answer it. But looking at uh, Africa being in between the, the, the China and, and, and US relations in terms of technology partners, uh, the spread of, of, of Huawei technology in Africa with, with what they have established in, 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 in telecommunications networks as well and how we also are starting to shift over, especially the, the, the public sector that is using more and more Huawei technology being embedded. Uh, where are we in this, in, 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 in this so-called trade war that is happening and how do we position ourselves to be at the end of the day not caught in the mix and still be able to have uh, sort of sovereignty that can we can we 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 can stand up to and say, look, uh, whatever happens in this outcome, whether Huawei dies or Trump doesn't get his way, but where are we in terms of sovereignty in that technology space going with five G ahead? Um, I think, yes, you started stirring something, yeah. and, and actually I wanted to comment regarding it, um, but you actually already closed with it. Um, I think what, what, what Given has said in terms of if our security is not ours, you will always be a victim. And whether it is China or whether it's America, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What I normally tell people is, if, if we're looking at and we're talking about cyber bullying, for example, your child is just as much a possibility of being a victim as a perpetrator. And we're all sitting with it. Every country has got the capability of being an aggressor and a victim. And it, is, it depends on whether the organization or the, the government basically backs it or whether it's individuals. But it's that situation. If we don't stand our own, own ground, if we don't develop our own capabilities, if we don't have our own resources, our own skill levels to the right level, we'll always be a victim. Um, we'll always come out as the worst one from the fight. It doesn't matter who it is. Um, you know, it, it, what you also said is it, it translates to every all the technology that we've got is foreign, or the majority of the technology that we've got is foreign. And it, it, it impacts on, on what I was also talking about is we're sitting with a situation of conducting investigations. All the all the, 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 the um, service providers, all the platforms, all the social media is in, 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 in foreign countries. We have no jurisdiction. Our laws are such that, listen, if the information is kept in Facebook, we have to go and knock on their door and say, oh, please, Facebook, we are the South African Police Services. We've got a guy that killed his girlfriend. Can you give us access to that information? He's a South African citizen. We should have that situation where, let's host all the data in, in, in where is it, Greenland? Um, I, I, ah. So, you know, we should have, have jurisdiction about <coughs> over all the data of our citizens. Whether it's kept in Dropbox, whether it's kept in Facebook, we should be able to access it. But yet, we're sitting here, we're asking, please, can we, can we, can we, can we? And we should be starting to do something about it. <coughs> so... I want to answer the first question a bit more directly in terms of who's the bigger threat between China and the US or whoever else. Uh, no one's the bigger threat. The fact is that it's pretty much a level playing field, like, uh, like we've said. The cyber field is the equalizer. So, yeah, the US has got a lot of technology companies. We use a lot of their technology. And it's been found that a lot of their technology is being used or those companies are partnering with the US government and handing over data or whatever they're doing. China at the same time does it as well. So the US sort of goes on about the Chinese boogeyman, if I had to quote Harun Mir, and the Chinese go on about the US boogeyman, but no one's really looking at Russia, Iran, or anything else. Yeah, we don't use Russian technology a lot. There has been questions about Kaspersky, which is one of the largest endpoint security providers in the world, uh, because they're a Russian company as well. So um, it's really, you know, it, it's really a level playing field at this moment. And it's down to what you want to prove. But then it does come back to the, the technology sovereignty. We need to be able to develop more technology ourselves. But that doesn't mean we have to start from scratch either. Um, there's a hell of a lot of open source technology that's supported by communities that aren't only US-based or Chinese communities. They are based all around the world 
And they support this technology because they use it themselves. Look at Apple. Apple used um, FreeBSD as an operating system, underlying operating system for their iPhones and for Mac OS. Um, Google used Linux for Android. And these are operating systems that are open source. You can go get that right now. So South Africa doesn't have to build its own operating system, so to speak. They can go and take one of the other operating systems. And I'm sounding like Haroon right now because that's a lot of the things that he talks about in those two talks I, I, I um, put in my presentation. So the, the, uh, to address the second question, where we are from a South African point of view, we're not very far, but we've got the capability. We have the people. We have the skills. We have to foster those skills a little bit further, and we have the capability to actually start doing and making an impact in the world as well. Okay, right. So, um, are there any questions on digital forensics? I've got a question now. I think okay, you go first and then. <laughs> <laughs> no, my, my question is about, uh, you spoke about uh, the, the legal framework. It seems to me, though, when, when we try to fix the traditional legal framework to try and sort, uh, to try and address the cyber challenges or the cyber crimes, we're always going to face a problem. Uh, because uh, you, you pointed out, I mean, I've always, I, I deal with this with my students as well. Uh, shouldn't we be looking at creating new laws rather than trying to fix the old laws? Because fixing the old laws is just fraught with difficulty. If I was an American preacher, I would say, Amen, brother. <laughs> it's, it's definitely what I, I totally agree with it. What we're trying to do is we're trying to amend old, outdated legislation. It's like trying to fit a, a square in, in, a, in a round hole. We are steering around it. We are using the ECT Act to introduce uh, crimes um, instead of putting them in, in where they, they're supposed to be. We're trying to use the, the new Cyber Crimes Act to try and ch make changes to the old uh, Criminal Procedure Act. Why don't we just look at what our situation is currently, get new legislation in place. And then also, one of the speakers mentioned, the new Cyber Security Bill, it, it, it's in process for three years. You can never have a situation where technology changes in 30 days, 60 days, max, and your legislation takes three years. We are trying to write it to such a way that it's generic, but you know, we should be we, we should be defining those problems. That's uh, how do you access a guy's data that's uh, cross border? How, in terms of Budapest Convention, those type of places. How do we cooperate in terms of getting access to that information quickly? Because a criminal is hiding, he's routing his he's tracks through uh, Bangladesh, through Ukraine, etc. How can we trace that if it takes us six months to re to request that information? Okay. Right, no, Thank you very much. So I think the first one, my first question is going to piggyback on Manoj's one, uh, speaking to the issue of, um, uh, what is it, the law, the legislation and the criminal justice system really, and how prepared is South Africa, and I think the answer is very obvious, we're not prepared. And the fact that will the same kind of um, laws that apply to traditional crimes be able, will, will it be as if, it, will it be effective in terms of prosecuting cyber crime. So that's the, that perhaps is a comment. Uh, but I think the big one for me over the past two days has been, and I said this a couple of times outside of the conference, is that the biggest threat is a person. And the worry for me is that in the conference over the past two days is that we've been speaking at a level of abstraction where the human has almost been forgotten. And it's, it's quite ironic that you say hackers are people too. <laughs> and, 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 and one of your comments, and, and, and I just say this as an observation, and one of your comments with the Stuxnet issue was that it was a USB. <coughs> it was a, one of those gadgets. Yeah. So it wasn't a person who who had the USB, etc. It was a USB. Uh, it was. It was a person. It was actually a scientist that carried it into there. Yes, but the scientist was a person. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that we, it seems as though, I think what's absent is how do we, how do we bring, to, how do we marry the, the, the abstraction with, uh, so I'm going to be over now, Manoj, with, with the issue of people, because I think your biggest threat is is people. 
The, um, you, you, it's always a person. Um, so when I was in crime <laughs> intelligence, if we had to, to gain access to an organization to find out, to, to collect information, the simplest thing was to drop memory sticks in the parking area, in the, the lobby, etc. And You didn't need to have uh, sophisticated attacks. It was the simplest thing to do. Um, uh, we, we still have some very, very nice tools where, for example, within your charging cables of, of your cell phones, we've got um, a little computer, uh, raspberries built into it with uh, cables, so I can take over your, your computer and your cell phone through your charger uh, cable nowadays. So it's always that knowledge of people that, that is lacking, the ethical level of people. You know, in South Africa, we're sitting with a situation of, I can go to a bank employee, we've conducting investigations, bank employees, that was bribed with 2,500 uh, 2, bucks to carry a memory stick into some of our biggest banks and stick it in inside. So that's always, always your concern. I think over the past two days, a lot has been mentioned that cybersecurity consists of is the aspects of technology, people, and processes. And the aspects of people, a lot has been mentioned about security awareness. And that's teaching the average user about typical threats. Um, we don't, we're not going to be trying to teach them about how blockchain works or how machine learning works. We need to give them information about basic threats, the WhatsApp scams, the, um, the phishing and smishing, and giving basic examples of how easily they can be scammed. Cybersecurity awareness programs are very important for organizations. And I mean, that's a big part of strategy in terms of strategy and policy and putting on an awareness campaign as part of the organizational education drives. Yes, there will be technical users in the organization, but getting the information down to the ground, basically to the normal user, it was mentioned, clean desk policy, email policy, password policies, all of these smaller issues can try to create more awareness about all of these smaller issues and how these backdoors are being created into systems and networks. So yes, there's a big drive and a big need for cybersecurity awareness programs in organizations that are not just at a technical level, but more at a lower level. Sorry, can I, can I just make one comment on that? Um, Thanks. So um, when, it, when it comes to security and securing, securing systems and companies, people often think, oh, you need so much money to do it. That's one way that you don't need a lot of money to do it. You can go on to go Google awareness training, uh, security awareness training material. There's tons of it free online. You go print some out, you stick it up on walls, you send out a friendly email every now and then. You have discussions around the coffee machine or something like that if you want to. So it's a really easy way to start securing the humans. So unfortunately, we've come to the end of the day, and it's a, been a bit of a kind of a, you know, a freight train hurtling towards 4:30. Um, uh, we, I'd like to thank our panel members very much for this final session, and um, maybe given or uh, Stephen, if you have any final comment that you'd want to make on the questions <coughs> that have been posed or. <coughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we, we were in a, in a position where our backwardness is an advantage. The fact that we have not really, we are not as connected is a good thing. So what matters now is how do we then get our people when they, I mean, I, I heard that the president was talking about the spectrum and all that. Now when that happens, when that data is no longer expensive, how would we want our people to be introduced into the space? How do we make sure but that when they come into this, that space, the content that is there, and they already know that these are the risks that go with this whole thing. So I think it's important that we do that. So we, we look at the stats of unemployment. Look at how many people are, are, are you know, graduates and all that. It's, and for, I need to say it's a good thing, but we need to do something for it to remain, to be good for the country. So we have the people, it's always about the people. We have the people. All we have to do is do the little things, as I said. Um, and that's it. We, why do we need to have a, a, a degree that's four years when we can go into the township and just sort these things out? And, and, and that's it. There's, there's computers that are being auctioned off that are lying in passages that we can take there and do something for the security of the country. It's not, it's not a CSI project. It's a security project. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Just quick, quick. I interviewed a guy this week. He is 21 years old, coming from a township. Never knew his father. 
no money for education. He taught himself. I had a doctorate in my office, one of my personnel, sitting, I have a penetration tester that earns more than a million a year. Both said to me, this guy's got more knowledge than anybody else in this office. Wow. 21 years old, taught himself everything. Uh, obviously, we're going to appoint him. Hands off, sorry. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I think the time has come for us to, to really build solutions, build our own technology. <laughs> And I think the common thread here is that we need to get ahead of the curve. We need to build our own technology. And I think the, the issue of China uh, and the US, the Huawei issue, I think we should learn from it. And, and there's a positive component uh, because Huawei now, it, you know, initially <coughs> innovation was stifled, but now they can build their own software. They can build their own platforms even though they have been denied access to, to Android and so on. But now they, they have the opportunity to build their own technology. So I think we should learn from such experiences and, and to build our own technology. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And I'll hand over to Prof. Maharaj. Yeah.